turn with me this morning to Philippians 2, verse 15 through 16, is our text this morning. Philippians 2, verse 15 through 16. And let us pray before we get into the word. Father, I thank you that on this uh, rainy, cold day, Lord, that you have um, brought your church here, that people are here and ready to listen. And Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see, even me as I read your word. And Lord, speak through me, Lord. You say in your word that... um, Teachers will be judged more strictly, so Lord, uh, help me, help me, Lord Jesus, to apply this to my life. Lord, you, uh, you also ask for those who are hearing to have ears to hear and eyes to see, and so Lord, I do pray that this church would be given that this morning, that grace, that you would open up their hearts and their eyes to see wonders in your word. In your name, amen. Philippians 2, verse 15 through 16. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So my main question in this sermon is, how can a Christian be blameless? How can a Christian be blameless? That's the question that I asked myself when I read this. What does he mean by the word blameless? And to get an idea of that, I think we need to go back to the Old Testament because this word blameless is used throughout Scripture. It's carried on throughout Scripture, and even just the, the word blemish should take us back to the Old Testament. Uh, when he says, uh, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, the, the idea of blemish car- carried with it a sacrifice. When Israel would sacrifice their lamb to God, especially the Passover lamb, it was to be without blemish or spot. It was to be a perfect lamb, a sacrifice of worship to God. And and we know Christ is our perfect sacrificial lamb that covers all of our sin and makes us blameless. And, And we're told in Romans 12 that we are to be We are to be living sacrifices, offer our body as a living sacrifice. So we are to be without blemish. And so we go back to the Old Testament with this concept. And Genesis 15, 6 is a good place to start. If you'd like, you can turn there. Genesis 15, 6. It's not a hard one to find. Um, Genesis 15, 6 is what God says about Abraham. This is a key text that is carried on throughout Scripture. It's talked about in Hebrews in the Hall of Faith with Abraham. Abraham, it's talking about Abraham here. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God and by faith he was given the righteousness of God. Because God had looked over the sins of the Old Testament because Christ was going to have his blood shed for the past, present, future, all of the sins of every generation that believed in Christ. And and so it was given to Abraham as righteousness. Now, if you know the story of Abraham, the very next chapter after Abraham was given righteousness, Abraham does a really stupid thing. And he listens to the doubts of his wife who said, I'm old, I'm not going to have kids. We know Abraham is actually believing God about making him a great nation. God makes three promises to him. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you a land. And I'm going to bless the entire world through your seed. And the word seed is used singular. So through one of your seeds, I'm going to bless the entire world. And we know that that was through Christ. 
as the genealogies trace all the way back to Abraham from Christ. But in chapter 16, Abraham listens to Sarah and sleeps with her servant so that he could have children through her. What in the world? Abraham, who was given righteousness, is an utter failure here. And we see this with Abraham often. He fears things and then he makes a really dumb mistake out of that fear. And how many of us, if we were honest, if we could think back to when we accepted Christ as our Savior and then we think through times in our life when we sinned out of fear because we feared something and we took matters into our own hands and we maybe hurt someone that we loved or most importantly, we hurt the God who died on the cross for our sins in whom we worship. And then notice in chapter 17, verse 1, it says this. God says to Abraham, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. God doesn't give up on his children, no matter how much they may fail. He says, Abraham, walk before me and be who I've called you to be. Be blameless. How do we do that? How do we be blameless in our lives? Does he say, is he saying be perfect? The only way I know how to illustrate it is a basketball illustration. When I was uh, at Moody, I played two years, freshman and sophomore, and then I got married and sports was over at that point. I had other priorities and other things that were much better than sports, okay? Much better, all right? This is a positive thing. But sports were over, but I did go back and watch um, the team play. A lot of my friends still played on the team. You know, they, they kept playing all the way through, and I went back and watched him, and there was this new freshman that was a point guard, and... I'll never forget him. I, I never forgot his name, Josh Edwards. And he, he was the worst at finishing on a fast break layup. He could not make a fast break layup. But he was the fastest kid I had ever seen play at Moody. He was so fast and he was, because he was so fast, he would steal the ball all the time. And one time I remember he stole the ball from their point guard, ran all the way down the court, Went for the layup, bricks the layup, okay? They get the rebound, he comes back, he plays defense again, he steals the ball again. He runs all the way in, bricks the layup again. Third time, third time's a charm. Steals the ball again, goes all the way down the court and bricks the layup again. And everybody is like, come on, right? What in the world? But you know what? I remember him more than anybody else that played during that year. Because he never gave up. He never gave up. You see, when you have that happen in basketball, it's a little embarrassing. And you tend to be a little more on the defense at that point, and you're not quite as, I, I mean, that's how I am at least. I, I, I would be a little scared to steal the ball again because I might miss the layup, right? But he never stopped. He just kept fighting and fighting and fighting and he was so much fun to watch and at the end of the game if the team lost nobody said Josh it's because of Josh nobody said that because he gave it his all and he was always so joyful and happy he was one of those players that didn't think he was better than everybody else maybe all those missed layups kept him humble but he had this joy about him that just, and now he's, he's in ministry in Chicago and he's doing great things for God in Chicago. And I love it that we have people up in Chicago doing great things for God. But he had this joy about him. And I think, you know what? He knew at the end of the game, he laid it all on the court. And as believers, we are called to fight that way. We will make mistakes. We will have moments where we put our foot in our mouth. We will have moments where we say something we shouldn't or think something we shouldn't and, and we'll feel conviction about that. And what the enemy would love 
to do is to cause you to just throw in the towel or be afraid to keep fighting for fear of being called a hypocrite, for fear of messing up again. And so that's what Satan would love to do. Notice how in this text, he says, as you shine as lights in the world amidst a twisted and crooked generation. That is the purpose here. The purpose is to shine out the light of Christ. You represent God Almighty. Walk before him and be blameless. You see, Abraham and Israel, they were called to go into the land and represent God well. And that's why they took sin very seriously. And they had this long sacrificial system that every time that there was a sin or some kind of impurity, that that needed to be paid for and taken seriously. They were to be lights in a dark, dark world, in in a world where people were sacrificing their own babies to gods and all kinds of crazy things that were going on. And they were supposed to be different and set apart and holy, a holy nation. And that is what we are to be as Christians and Christ followers, a holy nation with striving to be without blemish and offering our bodies as a sacrifice because of what we just went through in Philippians 2. This God who came down, made himself nothing, this Jesus who took on our flesh and humbled himself and emptied himself for us in perfect obedience to the Father for the goal of redeeming us and dying on a cross, on a cross, not just death, but even death on a cross for us. That is the God that we serve. You see, I've been in sports where, um, where when I was in high school, I had a coach who, if you made a mistake, out. You're out. He'll just take you out. Not a purposeful mistake. I'm not talking about, you know, sitting back and slacking off on defense. I'm talking about you just miss your layup. He would, it was like this constant fear that you could be taken out of the game for a mistake that you made. And I hated being under a coach like that. But my coach at Moody wasn't like that, and there was never that fear that I felt. <clears throat> and the same was with this kid. You see, every time he, he, he failed, he just kept at it again. And he knew that the coach would probably give him some drills to do to work on his layup and to to help him get better. And that is the God that we serve. He works on us and he never, ever stops working on us and pursuing us because of his great love for us and because he sees the righteousness in us. Do you notice how God saw righteousness in Abraham before he sinned with Hagar? And that is how we are as believers. God sees you and he sees this. He sees the precious blood that was spilled that covers all of your sin and the righteousness of Christ imputed to you and given to you. And you are blameless before him. You're blameless. I talk to people sometimes, close friends, that often have a sin in their past that maybe affected their marriage or affected some person and they have a hard time forgiving themselves for that sin in their past. And they dwell in it and they're like, I just really struggle with that. And, and one of my close friends, I'm constantly pointing him to the fact that Christ is, has completely covered him and that he is, he is freed from that sin and that sin is separated from him as God does the same with David. Your sin is separated from you. He sees the righteousness of Christ and, and he's going to continue to pursue him. And I, and I just ask him, do you, do you believe that Jesus died for your sin? Do you, do you know that God loves you? Do you want to follow after God? Then that's it. Rest and be at peace. Don't live in insecurity and and. and, and worry that God's going to give up on you, that he's going to take you out of the game. Don't worry like that. That's why Jesus said, my burden is light. I came to free you of that, that constant struggle of striving to please me because you can't ever be perfect enough to go and come to heaven on your own. 
And so he did it for us, separating us from our sin. And now, church, we are able to run more freely as my friend Josh did. And if we make a mistake, we get right back at it. And we just keep going. And we have a Lord and a Savior who is cheering us on. And he believes in us. That really shocks me. That God believes in me so much that he has entrusted with me, as it says in 1 Corinthians, he has entrusted me and entrusted you with the message of reconciliation. That you are to represent him on this earth. And that is why Paul is saying this. Listen, church, be blameless. Be pure. Be innocent. Seek innocence. Because you are a child of almighty God. And so live that way in this world and and embrace that and do it confidently because he is in you. Next, I think we need to address how, what light does. He says, as you shine as lights in this world, you are shining the light of Christ in this world. And, and light exposes things. It exposes everything in a room when light, light is turned on. And so we are called to be that light and to be a preservative in the world that we live in. And if we have to, we speak truth in times when truth needs to be spoken. And we do it in grace and in love and in mercy and knowing that (laughs) we wouldn't know anything if it weren't for Christ. So we need to do it in a loving way, but we speak truth. Church, this last Sunday, we watched the Super Bowl and social media blew up this whole week. And it's still blowing up, I think, because of the, the halftime show, the Super Bowl. And we didn't watch it. Uh, we, I never, I stopped watching the Super Bowl halftime show when the wardrobe malfunction happened, right? I was with a youth group and we had the opportunity, where we, this is when we were students in Chicago and we were, it was our PCM, which is our practical Christian ministry we serve in. And we were serving at this church and we were there for the Super Bowl and they were watching the game um, and they had the halftime show on, but I was, I was down playing basketball with the youth because you could sit and watch the halftime show or watch or play basketball. It's like Janet Jackson basketball, come on. So I went and played basketball. And then all the youth come down, you won't believe what happened. You know how youth are. You know, it was like this big drama, you know. And, and it was like, wow. And I just was like, yep, never going to watch the halftime show at church. I felt so bad for the youth pastor. I thought, oh, man. I hope, I would hate to be in his shoes. Is he going to get calls, you know, like, why were you watching the halftime show? Um, so we didn't watch the halftime show at, at the men's thing. We always have a little devotional. Um, and, and of course, you couldn't help but find out about it afterwards. And it's like, guys, come on, what, what, what do you expect, almost, in a sense? But it was, I think it was that it was so bad. There was even memes kind of mocking that came out afterwards, and it said, um, the NFL has decided to remove most clothing since the, to, to keep from mal- wardrobe malfunction functioning happening. You know, it was, it was that bad and there was a, a, a pole and it was like a stripper pole kind of a thing. It was crazy, right? It's just absolutely crazy. And this is what saddens me more than anything, okay? Is that when I was talking to my sister about it, she says, I'm so frustrated. She says, because... She lives in like the Bible Belt and she said, it's just like so many Christians just thought there was nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Like they're they're post, they're post, they're defending it on social media that there's nothing wrong with it. Our children are watching this. I I saw somebody comment that my eight-year-old loved it. I don't see what the problem is. I mean, it's like, it's almost like it makes me think of the story of the, the emperor with new clothes. Do you remember that story? I don't know if anybody reads that anymore. But I watched it when I was a kid and it's a story about these, these weavers that come in and they make clothes for this, this king who doesn't care about his kingdom and all, all he cares about is, is how he looks. And so um, they're like, hey, we're gonna play a joke on him and we're gonna tell everybody that this special clothes that we make, that if you are ignorant, then, um, then you won't be able to see the clothes. 
and they don't even make any clothes and they pretend to put the clothes on the guy. And so he comes strutting out in front of everybody and everybody's told this and so everybody, nobody says anything and they're just cheering him on like, oh, it's such great clothes, right? And it's like finally a kid's like, the guy's in his underwear, right? And, and, and he exposes what's happening. And I feel like that's how we're, we are in our society. It's like, are we completely blind to what is going on in our society? We wonder why there are men being arrested outside of the Super Bowl in the parking lot for sex trafficking. Literally, men outside of the Super Bowl. And yet we're glorifying this, the objectification of women right on the main stage in the Super Bowl halftime show. And we wonder why we got problems in our culture. Church, we shouldn't be surprised because a culture that is turning away from God does not know right from wrong or their right from their left. They just don't. So we shouldn't be surprised about that. But the problem is when we start thinking that that is okay. When we start encouraging that, that is a problem. Because we are called to be the light of the world. We're called to be blameless. We are the, the, the salt that preserves the world that we live in. And if we are backing down on things and being like, ah, it's no big deal, and then we wonder why our little girls think that their body is everything that they are, and we wonder why we've got problems with that, we should be able to see it for what it is. Because we know that God created the beauty of a woman for marriage relationship, for oneness inside of marriage. And to expose that for anyone is dangerous. And we see it happening in our culture today. And so we are called to be the light of the world. And as we do that, we are going to upset some people. You will upset some people. When I was a teacher at DCS, we'd watch a movie clip, and then I would, I would turn on the lights, we're done watching the movie clip, everybody would just, oh, okay, I just knew it was coming. Like, I knew they would just complain about turning the light back on. They wanted the light off, they wouldn't take naps, probably, you know? And so, I, I turned the light off, everybody's, oh, your eyes adjust. And that's how I feel like, for us as believers, when we turn the light on, people are gonna go, ah. Oh. But then as we, through relationships, seek to lovingly, guide them and show them the light of Christ that hopefully they would kind of, then their eyes would adjust and then they would start to realize, you know what, they have a point. I saw this with girls in our youth group in, in, uh, in Spokane. They were outside the church. They were coming to youth group consistently and, you know, typical good you know, Baptist church, we're gonna have rules on what you can wear at a, at a, uh, a swimming party, you know? So we were, we were going, and there's times where I'm like, I swear I don't even want to do anything in water anymore. The drama that comes with it is just, is just more than I want to deal with. But we, we had a, a whitewater rafting trip, and these girls had the tiniest little string bikinis, and we had it on the thing, you know, like one-piece suits, and one of our youth leaders, this big, huge, macho guy, he's like, he's like, cover up, and he just walks right past him, and I'm like, oh my goodness. And I'm like, okay, we need to deal with this. So I ended up talking with them and their mothers after it was over, and we had a really good talk, and I just, and I just told them, I said, I understand this is how our world dresses. I understand that that's normal today. We're different. We're just different. And this is why we're different. And I talked to them a little bit about why we have that and why we want to teach modesty, because modesty is not something that our culture values in any way. Modesty is just not something our culture values. And so you're going to be different. And growing up as a teenager, I really struggled with confidence in myself, as most teenagers do. And I was in sports and all that, but I never was really a part of the in-group because they would always be partying and everything, you know? And, and they would look at magazines. I remember one time a friend of mine was looking at a dirty magazine, and I just like kind of walked the other way. You know, I grew up like so conservative as compared to, to how the kids were at school and, and I didn't talk about girls like they did in the locker rooms and, and I didn't engage in that. And there were times where I felt like maybe I, like there was something wrong with me that I didn't get invited to, to, to hang out, you know. And I, it, was, it was a struggle, it really was, especially in middle school. I think middle school was the hardest because um, there was just no respect at all at that point. 
And then I look at our teens today, and they have more issues than I had. If they even ever stand against the LGBTQ powerhouse that's out there, they will be labeled ignorant. They will be labeled a bigot. They will be treated, they will be treated poorly for that. Young women embracing modesty. If our girls, like my, my, my daughter, my daughters, raising them up and, and trying to teach them modesty in our culture today, they're going to be looked at probably by some as, as just oppressed and, and old school and not progressive and, you know, like you must be, you know, it must be really hard to be you. That concerns me. And so we have to go out of our way, church, to engage our young people into helping them value the things that God values. To help them embrace the different. Different is good. Embrace it, and I hope they embrace it with more confidence than I did. That they keep that confidence that they are the light of the world but they, they do it in a humble, a humble sort of way. That they're not better than those kids, but rather this is just who they are. We need that today so bad. And young people, I hope you know that sometimes when you don't see any fruit, in the end you'll see fruit. I had a, um, a kid from high school. After he was the partier in high school, we were friends, but we never really hung out. And after high school, he contacted me because his girlfriend broke up with him and he was trying to decide, he was trying to figure out this God thing, if God really does exist. And during that time, I got to have a major influence in, my li- in his life. And he called me up, he wanted to hang out. And I'm like, Matt Waters is wanting to hang out with me? Like, I can't believe it, you know? And so we hung out and we became really good friends during that year after high school. And I saw him put his faith in Christ and during that time, and I saw him turn around and, and, and stop the carrying on like so many other people were his age. It was so cool to see that. So what you may think, you're not making a difference, you, you may never know later that they go, you know what, there's something about that guy's faith, and I'm going to talk to him because he started asking me all these questions about God, and how do you know the Bible's true? And he asked me all these more intellectual questions, and it was so cool to see how God worked through that situation uh, basketball. I play basketball on, uh, I was hoping Bill, I guess they had to do children's church. I was hoping Bill was going to be in here because there's one guy that he really likes that used to play basketball with us all the time here in, at, at Riverside. And, it, and it's a lot of guys from the inner city. I mean, I'll be honest with you, our gym smells like marijuana every Monday night. It is like packed full of these guys and they come right from, they're not, I haven't caught any of smoking here at the church, all right, none of that going on. But they, but they do come in and it's on them. And I want to reach these guys for Christ. And often I feel like, am I just spinning my wheels? Do they even listen to the little devotional that we have? I don't know. And then recently a guy moved and I hadn't seen him for a year. And he just contacted me um, yesterday. And he's like, TJ, man, we got to hang out sometime. He's like, I'm going to be in Decatur in a month. And it meant, so I was like, wow, I never thought that I had any influence on this guy. Maybe, maybe he wants to talk about the Lord. I'm praying that he does. So you never know what God could do through relationship and through standing on truth in a graceful way. And I haven't been perfect at it. Like I said, I struggled with confidence a lot growing up. Lastly, we see in this text, next week we're going to talk about Paul and his influence on the church. But lastly, we see our hold fast to the word of life. Hold fast. That means exactly what it says. Don't let go. Hebrews 3, 14 says, we have come to share in Christ if we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Persevere. Hold fast, church, because it is your very life. When I think of this, I think of a time that I was rock climbing with a friend without any ropes or anything, and it wasn't straight up, but it was pretty steep, and we got into a spot. We thought it would be easy. We got into a spot that it was like a little sketchy, and it was towards the top, and we're way up high, and it's like if we started to fall, 
we're going to get hurt really bad or die probably. And so we're on this cliff with both feet on, on, on uh, two spots and both hands. And I tell him like, man, make sure you have a handhold with both hands and both feet all the time. Because if something lets go and you only have one hand on, you're going to fall. And it was scary. And I remember just being like, oh, Lord, get, just get me through this. It was really scary. My wife was not very happy with me. And, and I was like, what was I thinking, right? But the whole point is, I was holding fast because my life was on the line. And that's what he's saying. That's the picture that he's giving us here. Hold fast to the word of life. It is your very life. There, are, there is life in the word of God. It will bring you life. It will give you life. It will help you through every situation in your life. And it will keep you focused on the hope that you have in Christ. So hold fast to it with everything that you have. Cherish the word of God above all else. Above every other philosophy or worldly idea that comes your way, hold fast to the word of God above all else. In your name, let's, let's go ahead and pray and then we'll have the worship team come on up. Father, we just, um, we just pray, Lord, that we would hold fast. But we recognize that in our flesh, we miss the layup sometimes. We lose some grip. But Lord, help us to remember that we have a God that is so loving and caring and full of mercy and grace Lord, that you were patient with Abraham, with Moses, with David, all the way up through to the New Testament, and you were patient with your disciples, with Peter, and, and, and all of the 12, and then patient with Paul and using him to, to advance the church, Lord. Use us, Lord, to be lights in a ever-increasing, chaotic, and confusing generation. In your name we pray, amen.